I'm Greg Lefebvre, and this is The Compulsive Storyteller, the podcast where we explore the idea that truth is stranger than fiction. While working on season two of the podcast, we thought we would share the first episode of a new ongoing series we call Shorties, groupings of short little stories about a particular theme. Twice Blessed I'm not a religious person, and I don't believe in any sort of traditional God. If there is one, it is, not he is, not she is, it is most probably a disinterested force like gravity, which, while exerting great influence over human beings, takes no notice of us at all. The spiritual for me is human connection, when we care selflessly for one another and when we feel real love. However, when I'm out in nature and have a fabulous experience, an experience that's so beautiful and special I'm almost brought to tears, I have a very strong feeling of being blessed, truly blessed. By whom and for what reason, I don't have a clue. What follows are two such stories, Big Sur and Silver Sphere. Big Sur The first time I was in Big Sur, I went looking for sea lions in the early morning along California Highway 1. This was before sea lions were doing so well that they were starting to become a nuisance in marinas and on crowded beaches. They make a lot of noise barking and roaring, so I thought I could simply drive along the highway, pull over and listen, and I'd hear them. There was one problem with my plan, though, because in the early morning, the steep hillsides that drop down precipitously from the highway to the Pacific are often buried in fog, so I might be able to hear them, but I could not see them. My first wife was along for the ride, but not really on board with the plan. She had no intention of climbing down to see the animals up close, but was concerned for my safety. This was near the conclusion of our 11-week honeymoon, slowly driving a VW Beetle across the country, and I had gotten us into a number of dangerous jams along the way, so her concern was definitely justified. After only a few stops, I found myself gazing into the shifting fog as I listened to the sounds of a colony of sea lions below. Their roars intermingled with the sounds of the sea and the calls of the gulls echoing off the surrounding rocky cliffs. I'm going to take a quick look, I called to my wife over my shoulder as I jumped over the guardrail and disappeared down the steep embankment into the fog. Of course, I neglected to read any of the signage by the guardrail and got into trouble almost immediately. The steep grade was composed of an accumulation of thousands of thin pieces of shale, and as I started down and dug my feet in, the whole field of shale I was standing upright on began to move. I realized there was nothing I could do to stop it, and based on the sound of the crashing waves that I could hear more distinctly now, I feared that the field of shale might slide over the edge of a cliff. So I spun around and flattened myself onto the moving gravelly surface. Everything continued to move for a few seconds and then came to a stop. Through a passing hole in the fog, I could see that I was about ten feet uphill from a sharp precipice of unknown depth, and I was now afraid to move at all. At that point, two things happened simultaneously as the fog closed in. My wife called down to me, Are you okay? I was fearful of yelling out and starting everything moving again, but I did respond loudly, No, I'm not okay. I might fall off a cliff. Get help. Then everything went quiet. I lay perfectly still and tried to get control of my rapid breathing. Time passed, and cold, wet clouds of fog rolled by. Just then, a small gray field mouse moved furtively across the jumbled shale, directly towards my face, which was pressed down against the flinty surface. He stopped a foot away, wrinkling his nose and smelling, trying to figure out what he had encountered. Then he decided all was well, and he moved right up to an inch from my nose. God, I said to myself, please don't bite me. He did not, but what he did was even worse. He put one of his forepaws against my cheek and then proceeded to insert his little nose, whiskers and all, into one of my nostrils to explore. I did everything in my power to keep from sneezing. Luckily, he quickly lost interest in any further exploration, turned around, and headed back from whence he came. 
At this point, the absurdity of the situation got to me, and again I had to restrain myself, this time from laughing. As the fog began to burn off, I finally got myself completely under control. Then I waited and waited and waited. The crackling sound of a bullhorn, wielded by a California state patrolman, interrupted my wait. Are you okay down there? I paused. No, I can't move. Then I had to say louder, No, I can't move. As I drew a breath to explain further, the shale field moved a bit, and I just froze. I didn't dare raise my voice at all. Are you hurt? I didn't answer. Are you hurt? Again, I didn't answer. Then it was back to waiting. I had no idea how long I'd waited, but eventually a lot of shale started sliding down from above me as someone rappelled down the slope, carrying a separate line and harness from me. By the time they got me up and out, scattered applause came from some of the many onlookers above who had assembled against the railing. Traffic was stopped, a helicopter hovered above, and a number of California patrol cars were jammed together in the middle of the road. The rubberneckers were all smiling, but the cops were not. After a big hug from my wife, she whispered in my ear, I love you, baby, but you're a total idiot. On the way back to where we were staying, we passed the Esalen Institute, the famous spiritual retreat and research center where someone had spray-painted with fluorescent orange paint the word HELP in all cap letters on the rough-hewn wooden sign, which I pointed out to my wife, and we had a good laugh. The next day, my wife decided that she couldn't bear another adventure, so after promising her that I wouldn't do any more rock climbing, I headed out to the scene of the crime, but this time during the afternoon, when all the fog had lifted. After all, I reasoned, my problem was the fact that I couldn't see what I was getting myself into, and now I could. Upon arrival, I could still hear the sea lions, and if I walked down the road a little, I could actually see one down below, sprawled out on a flat rock ledge by a boulder, just above the sea swells of the Pacific. Walking along the highway, I also noticed that there were signs posted at regular intervals on the railing, warning of the dangers of landslides and falling rocks. Even today, I'm still never one to read signs, or instruction manuals, or even contracts for that matter. On my walk, I discovered a ravine a couple hundred yards south, where I decided to make my descent. It was heavily overgrown with bush and small trees, so I wouldn't be rock climbing as I promised my wife I wouldn't. But I would be bushwhacking, and I got scratched and chewed up pretty badly. Halfway down, I came to a small, steep clearing in the bush and stopped to have a drink of water and catch my breath. As I turned to look back up the steep descent, there was a golden eagle on a branch of a dead tree. He was watching me and then leapt forward, spreading his huge wings and swooping directly at me. I ducked even as he missed me and then he disappeared out over the ocean. I think he was just warning me to back off. After some more struggling over the underbrush, where at times I was walking on matted branches and intertwined vines well above the floor of the ravine. Finally, I flopped out of the brush and arrived on the broad, flat stone ledge that I had seen from above. I backtracked to the area where I thought the basking sea lion lay, but there were a number of large boulders much taller than me strewn around the ledge, and so I lost my bearings. As I rounded a boulder very near the drop-off to the ocean, I found myself way too close to the sleeping sea lion, who was much bigger than he looked from up on Highway 1. He was asleep on his side, his head reclining on the rocky surface and his wrinkled and leathery hide moving up and down with his breathing. I must have made a sound because at that moment he opened one eye, saw me, and then in spite of his blubbery, massive body, leapt up and roared at me with a huge, whiskered, dark mouth wide open. It was a deep and resoundingly impressive bellow. Had he decided to attack me, he would have had me, but instead he turned and gracefully dove into the ocean creating a circular tidal wave and re-emerging 20 yards out, fiercely roaring and barking. The rest of the colony then joined in, and the noise of their combined distress calls echoed loudly off all the surrounding cliff sides. 
I decided that I was in no danger, so I sat down with my legs dangling over the edge of the ledge and watched. Within a few minutes, most of them had quieted down and returned to their places in the rocks. Only the old bull continued to express his annoyance with me, probably because I was sitting in his place, but finally he too disappeared. My perch was perfect. A light sea breeze carried a deep chill up from the ocean, while beds of kelp below me moved in a languid dance. I relaxed and life seemed perfect. The wind shifted and I became aware of a deep gurgling sound punctuated by a hissing noise that sounded like steam from a geyser. I got up and wandered around between the various boulders to locate the source, which was difficult to find because of the echoes. Finally, I came to a very large, 30-foot-tall, smooth rock outcropping with a crevasse that bisected it vertically. As I listened, first there was a deep gurgling sound and then the hissing sound like a rush of steam as a cold mist poured forth from the crack. My guess was that a couple of minutes elapsed between the two sounds, so I waited for the steam to subside, and then I entered the crevasse. It quickly opened up into a fantastically smooth, perfectly spherical, reddish-brown cave, lit by a wide shaft of sunlight. The gurgling sound was now deafening and frightening. Louder and louder, then a pause, and then a thick vertical column of seawater shot straight up, hitting the ceiling of the cave above and running down all sides of the spherical wall simultaneously. Then came the mist, and I was completely soaked. The cave was large and probably created over many centuries by the sea swells relentlessly pushing up from under the rocky shelf below, forcing the briny water up through the craggy fissure and relentlessly hollowing out this perfect space. It was by far one of the most amazing places that I've ever been in, completely captivating and awe-inspiring. My guess was that given how difficult it was to get here descending the crumbling cliffside and then navigating the labyrinthine boulder field, few human beings, if any, had ever been here before. This was one of those rare moments when I felt the meaning of the word blessed, truly blessed. After spending a couple hours in the sea cave, I got a real chill and had to leave. I sprawled out on the rocks, much like the old sea lion, to enjoy drying out in his place in the sun. The trek back up to the highway was even more difficult than my descent, but just before sunset, I threw myself out of the brush and climbed over the guard railing to my VW. I made one big mistake on this glorious expedition in part because I was so done in by the experience. I didn't take note of the mile marker, nor any of the landmarks, or the exact location of the place on my road map. Early the next morning, we left to return the car to San Francisco. But the place stayed clearly in my mind, and a few years later, when I visited San Francisco again, I made a second pilgrimage to find my sea cave. I spent the whole day driving and looking with no luck. It was lost in the fog that rolled down across Highway 1. Probably forever. Silver Sphere while vacationing on St. John in the U.S. Virgin Islands, a friend told me about some great snorkeling on a coral reef not too far offshore from Cruise Bay. The reef filled the channel between two small rocky islands. One was called Davis K, and its smaller neighbor was unnamed. Arriving alone in my sailboat on a perfect sunny day, I pulled down the sail and anchored, only to be discouraged to find that the channel was completely choked with millions of small fish. From above their dorsal sides, they looked blue-green, almost the same color as the water itself, and they completely obscured the view of the colorful reef life and coral beds that I'd come to see. Disappointed, I nonetheless slipped into the warm water with my snorkel and fins. The throng of tiny fish nearest me 
immediately scattered, but soon reconfigured as a spherical wall of silver, equidistant from me in all directions, their silvery sides flashing all around me. As I found myself swimming in this perfect bubble, created only by the rapid movement of the school, I realized this was turning out to be a beautiful experience after all. One of the great things about nature is this unpredictability. I swam slowly along, and the perfectly spherical space moved with me. When I thrust out one arm, the part of the sphere nearest my arm dissolved for an instant, but then reassembled. Just then, the whole school changed the direction of their swirling movement, and the bright sunlight caught all the fish's silvery mirrored sides at once, and a dazzling silver flash moved across the spherical space. After I tired of experimenting with thrusting out my arms and legs to see what happened, I decided to just languidly paddle along and enjoy the dance of light and movement all around these little creatures. I was completely mesmerized. Then, with no sudden movement on my part, in an instant, a dark, perfectly circular hole opened up in the wall of the sphere to my right, and a large silver tarpon rocketed across the space directly in front of me with his mouth wide open. He was probably five feet in length. His movement was accompanied by another silver flash across the wall of fish. As the hole closed up behind him, to my left, another perfectly circular hole opened up in front of him, and he was gone. The entire event took only a second. All the fish then returned to their original positions as if he was never there. I moved slowly with the school all the way to the end of the channel, hoping for another attack by the tarpon, but it wasn't meant to be. As I turned to head back to my boat, the school thinned and then disappeared completely. Now I could see all the colorful reef fish and corals that I'd come for, but was in such a state of awe from the spectacle that I just witnessed, I just hung in the water by the boat, looking down. I sailed back to Davis Cay a number of times over the years, but never again found myself in the middle of that beautiful silver bubble. No other skin divers or snorkelers that I've spoken to since then recalled experiencing anything like what I'd experienced that day either. So maybe I was, in fact, truly blessed. The Compulsive Storyteller is produced by Peter Kakoma and me, Greg Lefebvre. This week's episode featured an original score by Peter Kakoma, who also made our theme music. If you've enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe to The Compulsive Storyteller on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts, and it would be great if you could leave a review. Follow the show on Instagram at The Compulsive Storyteller, and check out our website for more information at thecompulsivestoryteller.com. Thanks for listening, and if you didn't like this one, the next one will be another story.